Welcome to AIN Debrief, where we take a look back at the most important aviation stories of the past week by the AIN editors who covered them. I'm AIN Alerts Editor Chad Trotvetter. In this week's episode, AIN Editor-in-Chief Matt Thurber gives a first-hand account of a sea turtle rescue flight from Seattle to San Diego. Air Transport Editor Gregory Pollock explains how the thawing of relations between Israel and the UAE and Saudi Arabia might positively impact Saudi overflights. Senior Editor Kurt Epstein discusses a newly available test that could help keep Jet A from being inadvertently contaminated by diesel exhaust fluid, and he also gives highlights from JetNet's mid-year report on pre-owned business aircraft sales. Meanwhile, Wichita-based editor Jerry Siebenmark shares an analysis report from industry watcher Brian Foley that suggests the charter industry might not really be experiencing a post-COVID bump. And finally, senior editor Carrie Lynch talks about why flight department managers need to be leaders in helping to restart post-COVID travel at their companies. Okay, so uh, Greg, you did a story on uh, Saudi Arabia allowing flights, uh, overflights um, of aircraft going between uh, the UAE and Israel. So, um, you know, the, the Middle East has been a sore spot for uh, for Israeli uh, flights, you know, for quite a while. So, what's going on? Uh, well, um, obviously, last month there was the. Um the agreement between Israel and the UAE to normalize relations and open uh, embassies in both both countries. And uh, just this past Monday, El Al flew the first, quote, commercial flight from uh, Tel Aviv to Abu Dhabi um, on a 737. It was more of a ceremonial sort of thing. But, um, you know, after that happened, it was unclear whether or not, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia had committed yet to allowing um, overflights over its territory into into Israel or the, or from Israel to the UAE. They did allow that just that one flight to happen, but uh, it wasn't clear whether or not that was going to be a permanent situation. The uh, official um, Saudi news agency uh, reported that Saudi Arabia will will allow overflights from the United Arab Emirates into any country, actually. So that would include Israel over its over its territory. That's that's a breakthrough in a way. There ha- hasn't been any talk yet about whether or not the Israeli airlines will be able to fly into the UAE right away. Um, there is one Israeli airline called Israel that uh, has has uh, signaled its intention to do so. So it's 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 an interesting situation because of just the political ramifications and the. the complications going on and it's it's just interesting that for example the emiratis haven't really said much about it and um you know there there is the, this underlying sort of issue with uh, the palestinians in the west bank and and uh, whether or not israel will continue to annex part of the west bank part of the deal called for a suspension of annexation activities but uh, apparently the emiratis weren't thrilled with that that kind of language because i mean it wasn't a it wasn't a strict commitment to doing so it seems maybe more temporary than permanent at this point yeah yeah i mean that, that's the way it was there, there was real no commitment as to how long the uh the cessa- the cessation of annexation activities would be um it's very it's very unclear the whole the whole situation is very very uh, opaque at this point for uh for the Emirati Airlines, does this open up uh, more direct routes to maybe Africa or um, elsewhere? Um, no, no, not not really. I don't think so. I think it's just a matter. It's the Israeli um, uh, situation. I mean, it, it, it's it would have been completely untenable to fly to Israel unless they could fly over Saudi Arabia. It would take seven hours or something like that to go around Saudi Arabia. The flight direct. The direct flight over Saudi it takes about three hours, and so it just wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, feasible to do it any other way. Um, so that's why it's so important that they do get the Saudi Saudi uh, approval to do this. So um, let's hop over to Kurt. Uh, Kurt, you did a story on uh, a new diesel emission fluid uh, test for FBOs to use uh, with their fueling trucks. Um, there's been some DEF contamination issues uh previously which when uh jet a is contaminated with def it makes the uh, fuel gel and it clogs filters and in uh, nozzles so 
what's what's this new test and how does it work and and what's the plan going forward for FBO? Well, Chad, yeah, as you mentioned, there's been a lot of high profile incidents where um, there's been de- uh, DEF, uh, diesel exhaust fluid contamination. It's a colorless fluid and it looks similar to um, fuel system icing inhibitor. And there's been cases where these have been mixed up and the DEF has been placed into fuel system icing inhibitor reservoirs on refueling trucks. And that's led to some downing of business jets. Uh, There's been, as far as I know, no fatalities involved in these, but there's been a couple very much white knuckle adventures for pilots when all of a sudden their engines quit out and uh, they had to force uh, force land back where they took off from or at other places. So there's been no way to test these. I mean, the, the cases where it's just been mistakenly put into reservoirs, There's been no way to test for this up until now, but a uh, company called MC Electronics, which produces fuel testing equipment, has come out with a new uh, simple test kit, which is marketed by – marketed by a company called Gammon Technical Products, which is a fuel equipment testing and distribution uh, provider. So the system, it's – very quick, simple test for the field. It's a chemical reaction. You take a sample of the fuel um, fuel system icing inhibitor from the reservoir, and you put it in a little beaker. You add some powder to it. You wait five minutes, and you look and compare the results to a uh, color chart like you would do with a, testing the chlorine on your pool. And it's funny because reading the adv- instructions, it says you can't – if you're uh, blue-green colorblind, you can't use it. But you do this, and it can detect concentrations of DEF as low as 2% in the uh, fuel system icing inhibitor. And uh, it has to be only tested in, the, uh, in that fluid. It can't be tested in gas. It doesn't, I mean, in, sorry, in the uh, Jet A. It doesn't work like that. So it's tested in the fuel system icing inhibitor before it's added into the, into the Jet A fuel system. You talked to NAT about this too. Is there any plans to include this in their Safety First program? or either training or requirements for FBOs? Well, NATA is very excited about this. They're certainly working to bring awareness of this, and it's something that they seem to be wanting to uh, to to spread and and have adopted. They currently don't have any requirements in their Safety First program for its use, uh, but they said that's something they're working with their safety uh, committee on to see whether it should be uh, something that's formally adopted. So you also did a story this, this week on uh, JetNet, uh, they did a mid-year report on pre-owned uh, business aircraft, and the good news is that the uh, the segment isn't panicking over the COVID situation. So, but you know, overall, what do they have to say otherwise? Well, yes, that's what they said, and that's the uh, the comments from Paul Cardarelli, who's JetNet's vice president of sales, is that. Uh They don't see any panic pricing setting in yet like they saw back in the aftermath of the global economic meltdown more than a decade ago. Um, Prices are seem to be holding somewhat. Um, Current inventory is now just a hair over 10%, which pushes it nominally into uh, buyer's territory, which 10% is considered the, uh, the dividing line between the buyer and seller's market. But they're not seeing a huge surge in inventory, and they're also not seeing the panic pricing. Sales have been down. Um, retail, uh, pre-owned sales have been down by about 19% year over year. But uh, from what they're hearing from brokers and dealers, their phones are ringing with offers, and the, the uh, sellers just aren't – giving in to distress sales, distress sales. So, you know, they also said, uh, you know, it's, there's the COVID, which is the overlying, overarching uh, crisis right now. But as JetNet pointed out, there's a couple other features at play here that also might have caused some, some degradation in the, uh, in the sales market. You had the ratification of Brexit early in the year. And then, of course, you have what is shaping up to probably be the most divisive, most bitterly contested election in U.S. history. And if you look at 2016 uh, as an example and a precedent, they also saw a downturn in activity during that year. So that's also something that could be a play this year. Yeah, they also said that 2019 wasn't as good as 2018, right? Yeah, 20. they said the uh, – as uh, Paul Cardarelli said, the market was already under stress, and he said that stress dated back to last year. And the pre-owned sales had declined from between 2018 and 2019 by about 12%. Inventory rose. So he said uh, 
those those underlying reasons were already in place before the crisis, uh, the COVID crisis, reared its ugly head. And I guess one of the things that they didn't talk about, but probably has an effect here, is that um, you know there's not a whole lot of new aircraft models coming out at least right now. I mean, you know, all the new aircraft models were certified last year, so you know, um, so there's really not a lot of competition of new models coming in uh, for the pre-owned industry, right? Yeah, they didn't address that. I mean, obviously, this was dealing specifically with the pre-owned industry. But you're right; there uh, there has been a, a slowdown in new market, new models entering this year. I don't think anybody really wants to have their make their aircraft debut in this in this environment. But um, right now, the segment that's really proving to be the most resilient is the uh, mid and super mid size uh, segment. And so far this year, asking prices for the aircraft that have sold or or leased actually increased year over year by more than 20%. So that's proving to be the uh, the bright spot in the industry. And uh, where light jets have been making a strong recovery, um, the asking price of those that changed hands so far this year is down by an average of about 200000 So uh, JetNet did notice that that segment appears to be making a rebound in June and asking prices are starting to come back up again. So, um, but that's the really the whole takeaway that they had in this is that owners seem to be viewing this whole thing as a temporary downturn and they're not making decisions based on long term fear. Good. Well, that's good to hear. Um, so, Jerry, let's hop over to you. Um, you did a story. Uh, uh, about Brian Foley's uh, take on the uh, charter market, which is seeing, well, at least the char- the industry is seeing that, saying that they're having you know more inquiries, um, but that hasn't kind of panned out into actual charter uh, traffic numbers, right? Yeah, uh, Brian Foley uh, suggests that there's uh, perhaps some uh, premature exuberance in terms of flying uh, private flying. He attributes that to seasonal demand, um, summer demand, sort of offset any uh, real impact from from COVID, um, and uh, but has also led uh, some operators to speculate that more people are turning to private aviation uh, because of COVID um, and not wanting to get on board an aircraft with. 150 other people, and they've been receiving a lot of inquiries, but Foley argues that those in- inquiries aren't necessarily translating to, to full-blown trips. What happens now? Uh, you know, the summer season is, is starting to wane. Um, and traditionally, you know, the business, uh, business travel starts to pick up in the fall. So, you know, what happens now? Foley goes on to say that he doesn't think that this – sort of rebound that we've seen over the summer months is going to extend into the fall months when business travel usually picks back up. Um, and in fact, uh, he suggests, and I quote, that the, the trip calendars for road warriors are pretty scant compared to with last year. So I guess it's really a matter of, uh, you know, waiting, waiting to see what happens. I didn't see if the other shoot drops. Right. And he also uh, he also said that the impression that uh, charter traffic is up when you know when the numbers aren't really bearing that um, could actually backfire, right? Yes, he did. Um, so obviously, you know, kind of going back to what we've seen this summer um, with the with the with the yeah sort of rebound at least from March and April um, in, 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 uh, in business aviation flying. And then, you know, we get the summer season, we get the demand uh, uh, there. The charter operator is suggesting that they're seeing a lot of inquiries and increase in inquiries. Well, that all leads sort of, uh, sort of these uh, glowing reports may backfire on them, um, may backfire on the industry uh, and should there be additional, uh, you know, government aid uh, in the works, um, you know, for various industries because of the sort of lasting impact of the uh, pandemic? Okay, thanks, Jerry. And I'm going to stay on the topic of uh, business aviation travel. Uh, Carrie, 
you did a story this week about the diminished business travel. Uh, uh, Cheryl Barden, who's the CEO of uh, aircraft personnel company API, um, she said that the flight department managers need to really uh, make sure that their voices are heard in the uh, in the company as far as COVID or post COVID travel, right? That's right, Chad. Um, So Cheryl Barden, this is an issue that's really near and dear to her heart. She's also, not only is she the head of Aviation Personal Personnel International, but she's also on the MBA board. And she recently brought this to the board and spoke on an MBA webinar on this very subject. Uh, The problem is, is if, of course, when everything shut down the pandemic, corporate flying pretty much ceased because companies and organizations issued all these do not fly um, mandates and, you know, legal and gets involved and HR gets involved. There's very much concern about employee safety. And so since then, there's been some flying picked up, but she's seen what she called almost a polarization where there are some companies that are flying a lot and others that are not flying at all. And she kind of issued, she in a blog she recently wrote, she kind of issued this rallying call to uh, aviation department managers that don't sit and wait for the phone to ring because it won't ring and then it'll be too late. And when people do start flying, they won't be using you. And, and she, you know, the point is, is if you're an aviation department manager, you're the key central people mover, if you will, of the company. So you should have an integral part, ask for a seat at the table to um, get ahead of the curve and create plans that foster health and safety and comfort level on travel and enhance the idea that business aviation is a very safe way to travel. And um, she, she said that not only should you be part of developing a plan and protocols, but you should be very proactive with it. And she cited companies who have developed go kits, which um, include, you know, cleaners for when you're in the hotel or, or rental cars or hand sanitizers and things to make sure employees feel level safety from the moment they leave the house to the moment they return all throughout the travel. So, um, and the other thing is she said, gather data and learn about your company's travel needs and use that to the advantage. Well, you know, people will need to move sooner or later and they will need to go visit their out, you know, their, uh, companies that are off site or their bases that are off site and their various different properties and companies. And, you know, get that data of when they're needed and how they're needed and, and, you know, plan ahead and go to your company managers and say, we can get you there. We can facilitate this continuation of business and we can do it very safely. And this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. She also addressed uh, opening up the aircraft use policy. Usually it's, you know, aircraft are typically reserved for sea level employees and some companies actually use, you know, for middle managers and stuff. But um, she's kind of calling for a wider net, right? Right. Well, because it, it's not just CEOs that travel in a company. Everybody travels. And you have this asset, a very, very expensive asset that's sitting on the ground and not being used. When you, when the people, who, the engineers and the, you know, operations managers and everyone else need to get their jobs done, they can't do it now. Or if they do do it, they have to do it um remotely. So get ahead and think outside of the box, be creative and, um, you know, show the use case of being able to use these planes to continue, you know, business at all levels. Um, And in fact, the MBA webinar that was recently held uh, covered that topic too. And um, Jay Orwin, who was with Masco, which is a home improvement company, was among the those who spoke on it. And he's the director of aviation with Masco. And he he gave an overview of his experience with his company, which was flying, you know, didn't fly at all at first, and now is flying fairly regularly and is going to pick up a third quarter. And he said they did it 
by commit by presenting this use case and being an end-to-end transportation services provider. But interestingly, he said they didn't do it by scaring people off the airlines. He didn't want to, you know, diminish the airlines. He did it by partnering with the company and explaining how business aviation could benefit them. So, um, you know, long-term, if you scare people off the airlines, then they may never want to travel and you want to keep people traveling because that's the whole business case for business aviation, obviously. Right. So that's pretty interesting. Thanks, Carrie. So Matt, you got to go on an adventure this week, uh, or actually over the weekend, you flew a a Piper jet prop uh, DLX with uh, Jeff Miller, who, who's a, a veteran uh, aviation marketing communications uh, executive. And uh, you guys had a very special passenger from Seattle to uh, San Diego, right? That's right, Chad. Uh, just uh, just about maybe a little over a week ago, Leslie Weinstein, who runs a charity called Turtles Fly 2, sent me an email about uh, the organization's first West Coast mission, which was to fly an endangered Olive Ridley sea turtle named Bernie from Vancouver, Canada to San Diego, California. Uh, there were some issues with crossing the border, so it turned out our flight was Seattle to San Diego. But I, uh, I mentioned uh, the opportunity to a few local friends and Jeff Miller, who flies a jet prop DLX, single engine turboprop, latched onto the idea and volunteered for the mission. Now Jeff is, does a lot of Angel Flight West charity flights, so he's used to the uh, used to the type of flying, but this was the first time he'd ever flown a turtle. So tell us about the flight, Matt. How, how did they load it? Uh, what did the turtle do during the flight? And how was it, you know, how long did it take you to get down to San Diego? So, so Jeff uh, lives in Sun Valley, Idaho. So on Saturday evening, he flew from Sun Valley to Portland International Airport and stayed overnight in a local hotel. Then Sunday morning, I met him at the Atlantic Aviation FBO at PDX, and we flew right to Seattle's Boeing Field where the turtle was being transported from Canada across the border to meet us in Seattle for the flight. Now, it was quite challenging for the Vancouver Aquarium people to uh, insert Bernie into the the airplane, which is a a turboprop conversion of a Piper Malibu. It's got a cabin entry door that's not super wide. So first they had to remove Bernie from his crate. He weighs 69 pounds, put him in the back of their minivan while we inserted the crate into the airplane in the back and then they grabbed Bernie and put him inside the crate and then reinstalled the top of the crate. So basically we had to fly two legs because we couldn't make it nonstop to San Diego. And we flew the first leg from Seattle to Reno, then Reno to San Diego, about two hours each. And during the flight, I went back to check on Bernie a few times we were at 25,000 feet and flying about 250 knots. And Bernie was just perfectly still the entire time. In fact, we were a little worried that he wasn't going to survive. But when we got to Reno, we shone a flashlight on Bernie. We poked him and moved the crate around to see if he'd move. And he just sat there. But finally, while I was watching him, I saw him blink. So I knew he was still alive. The the aquarium people told me that he breathes only once about every 20 minutes. So it's kind of normal turtle behavior. So after the the leg to San Diego, we landed there uh, about uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. And 
the SeaWorld people were there already in their van. Signature flight support was very helpful for us, both at Boeing Field and in San Diego, uh, opening the gates and getting the vans right up to the airplane. And we had a good crew there watching the uh, reverse operation where they had to uncork Bernie from the crate inside the airplane. And they had a special carrying crate for him. But before they pulled him out, they did a smart thing. And they, they put like a little jacket on him to keep his flippers uh, in case so he wouldn't kind of move around too much while they were getting him around. And they put him into the transport crate. And luckily, I got to go with the van and Bernie right to SeaWorld, where the first thing they did was measure all his uh, specifications, his weight, his size, and then I, I watched as they put him into a, a swimming pool. And boy, if we didn't think he was moving around before, he was now. He happily just started swimming around, exploring the edges of the pool, diving to the bottom and uh, acting a lot like a normal, healthy turtle. How long are they going to keep him at the uh, SeaWorld in, in San Diego? And where does he go after that? So the reason Bernie had to be transported is because the Vancouver Aquarium really didn't have the right space for him. And the water around Vancouver is too cold to release him. That's why he needed to be picked up because he really kind of took a wrong turn somewhere and ended up far too north in too cold water in the Alberni Strait, which is where his name comes from. So at SeaWorld San Diego, they can acclimatize him to the local warmer Southern California waters. And it'll, it'll be a few months and then they're gonna take a boat about seven miles out to sea and release him. And I've been invited to go on that trip and hopefully I can take advantage of that and close the loop on Bernie's story. Oh, that's really fantastic, Matt. It was a great trip, and uh, Jeff Miller deserves a lot of credit for volunteering and uh, doing a, a fairly strenuous flight over a short period of time. And it, we're all really happy it worked out for Bernie. Yeah, and the crews at uh, Signature uh, Boeing Field in San Diego and also uh, the crews at Atlantic uh, Aviation at Reno were helpful too, right? Absolutely. In fact, they waived any fees involved and uh, just did everything they could to help us out. We really appreciated that. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for listening to AI and Debrief. Another podcast episode will air next Friday. In the meantime, go to www.aionline.com for the latest aviation news from AIN. <laughs>